All right, good morning, everybody. We are going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Illinois EPA Office of Energy's webinar series on aeration and energy. We're excited to host our first session today for Lagoon Systems. Um, and we will, this is part one of three um, in our series about aeration and energy. So thank you for joining us today. Um, this webinar will really be an introduction of how energy efficiency plays a role in effective aeration. So we'll explore the role of aeration, discuss what is enough air uh, to properly treat wastewater and the reasons for why more aeration is not always better for treatment. So we'll dig into oxygen transfer efficiency um, and how temperature affects O2 transfer as well. So we'll talk a lot about different technologies and the roles of aeration equipment too. Um, so please, if you have questions throughout today's webinar, um, please place them either in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the chat button at the bottom of your screen. I see a lot of people are saying hello. Good morning, everybody. You're using the chat wonderfully. Um, so please keep using that chat throughout today's session. Um, also just wanted to let you know, um, we will be providing CEUs for this event. So it'll be one hour, so one CEU. Um, we can provide certificates for course um, for PDH credits as well. Um, so I'll pop my uh, email in the chat or put your interest in the chat for a certificate and CEUs and we'll get them to you as soon as they are available. We are still waiting for approval from the Illinois EPA Bureau of Water on those training credits, but never fear, um, we, they always come through so we'll get them to you as soon as they're available. Finally, we are recording today's session and we will provide the slides after today's event. So um, please feel free to share this with other people in your team. Um, but we will share that information with you after today's event. All right, I think I've covered all the basics, so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Jane McClintock to kick us off today. Take it away, Jane. Thanks, Cassie, and thanks everyone for joining us today for introduction to aeration and energy for lagoons. Um, we're excited to be here and glad you could join us. So we are CDAC. We assist uh, buildings and communities in achieving energy efficiency. Um, towards our overall goal of reducing the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. And we're at University of Illinois. And this program, which um, you know, is, is the reason that we're all together today is our Public Water Infrastructure Energy Efficiency Program, which is, um, is generously funded by the Illinois EPA Office of Energy and also the US Department of Energy. So we wanna thank those sponsors for um, bringing not only this free continuing education, but our program also offers um, no cost energy assessments and technical assistance. So um, we can provide a site visit analysis and comprehensive report listing the cost of upgrades, payback periods and applicable incentives and funding opportunities. And if you're not ready for a full assessment, we also have implementation assistance if you already know what projects um, you might be interested in. So all of these services at no cost, um, thanks to Illinois EPA Office of Energy and US Department of Energy. So thanks to our sponsors. And uh, why might you want to complete an energy assessment? If your lagoon is on the older side, if it hasn't been upgraded for a while, this is a great opportunity to plan for capital improvements and uh, see how energy um, can be a part of those improvements. Also see what kind of payback on investments can um, come just from energy efficiency, which can be a great way to argue or um, make a case for those improvements and investments with your local boards and communities. If your plant's newer or recently upgrade, there is always room for improve. to improve. Uh, lagoons have a great opportunity to go for net zero often as they have space for renewables. And um, it may just be great to see how you benchmark against other plants throughout the state to see if you're really as efficient as um, as you might, um, as you want to be. So um, an energy assessment is always a good idea. And if you're not ready for an energy assessment or just want assistance with the project, uh, still reach out to us. We're here for technical assistance as well as our no cost energy assessments. So it's pretty easy to apply for an energy assessment. There's initial application and pre-qualification, which you can find on our website, which um, is either cdac.org slash water or smartenergy.illinois.edu slash water. You need to be located in Illinois and be a publicly owned plant. And you have to allow us to uh, visit the site either remotely um, if you prefer, so we can do it over the phone um, and just discuss the information. 
and uh, or we can come out on site and we can take a look together. Um, you know, of course, we need to know some information about the facility and um, utility and um, information. So how much electricity you've used. And we need to be able to share the final report with Illinois EPA Office of Energy. They um, would like to see what we uh, what we find out about the various um, systems. And then we need a bit of data. So we need to know, um, but the biggest one here is really two years of utility bills because we can, um, of course, the, the DMRs are easy to, easy to access. So we're here to assist though with that process. Um, you know, we're happy to talk to your clerk um, to help um, get the utility bills organized and um, so we can analyze that data and do the assessment. Yeah, and then we'll just come out and, and take a look. So it's really not too big, too difficult of a process. Um, and we're always here to make it as easy as we possibly can. So our webinar today is gonna be about the fundamentals of aeration. Why do we aerate? So basically, where does the air go? What's it there for? Um, part two, uh, Sean will take over for how do we aerate? Like, where does the air come from? You know, what, what kind of equipment are we using? You know, how can it be more efficient? What are the factors that affect how efficiently we aerate our systems? And then finally, how do we control our aeration? And this is, um, you know, how do, how do we target the right amount of aeration for the, um, the demands of the system and so that we are aerating as efficiently as possible? So I'll start with the fundamentals here. Why do we aerate? What, you know, so we're all on the same page. What are the fundamental needs of aeration in our systems? And what are some factors that affect how much air is the right amount of air for our lagoon? So here, big picture, we've got carbon and ammonia coming into our wastewater from human activities. And that produces biological and chemical oxygen demand. Microbes, essentially they need oxygen to break down contamination um, through their, um, their processes. And the wastewater systems provide the oxygen to supply the required BOD. So that's the super big picture, but zooming in a little bit, biological oxygen demand. It's a chemical test, which is over five days um, to model the BOD uptake in streams. You know, so we're, we're getting rid of the biological oxygen demand so that it doesn't end up in our natural waterways and essentially deplete the oxygen and possibly you know, kill organisms such as this uh, sad looking fish here. So when we're, when we're looking at a concentration of BOD coming into our lagoon, we convert that with the flow into a number of pounds of material. And then we can estimate how much oxygen do we need to meet that demand. Another factor, which you're all gonna be quite familiar with is dissolved oxygen. This is measured in milligrams of free oxygen molecules per liter of water. So it's a concentration in a moment of time. Oxygen transfer rate is the rate at which the system is dissolving oxygen into the water. So this would be like, you know, how much oxygen is your blower putting into the lagoon or your surface aerators are drawing into the lagoon through their mixing action. And the key is that that um, oxygen transfer rate should equal the biological oxygen demand. How much oxygen are the bugs requiring to do the work that we need them to do? And that's gonna maintain a steady DO concentration. If the oxygen transfer rate is super small and the biological oxygen demand is really great, the DO concentration naturally is gonna reduce. We're gonna have a low DO concentration. This is a serious problem because, you know, sad fish, um, you know, we're not gonna get the adequate treatment that we require if we're not putting enough oxygen into the lagoon. But what about the other way around? If the oxygen transfer rate is super high and the BOD is relatively low, we're gonna end up with a really high uh, DO concentration. In a way, this is good because we're, you know, making sure that we have plenty of oxygen to ensure treatment, but we're also eventually going to reach a saturation point with the oxygen in the lagoon, and that oxygen is simply going to bubble off into the air, wasting money and uh, hurting the environment with, you know, the emissions associated with um, energy production. 
As examples, at 39 degrees Fahrenheit, DO is saturated at 11 milligrams per liter. Well, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it's more like 8.7 milligrams per liter. So a lot of us are probably aiming to maintain that like six uh, milligrams per liter of DO. But if we're, if we're significantly above that on a regular basis, we're really not, um, we're really wasting um, some amount of energy and not actually improving our treatment. So balancing DO and oxygen transfer rate is critical to this discussion of aeration and energy, and is also critical to min minimizing our facility costs while effectively treating water. So we don't wanna underdo it, but we don't wanna overdo it either. So we wanna talk about what kind of, what kind of um, demands on oxygen do we have in our system so that we can target our aeration to meet those demands and not overdo it. So, the carbonation spod that's like the like the solid stuff that comes in and needs to get um needs to get taken care of um by the bugs this is our happy meals and then nitrogenous bod this will be like the ammonia which is coming in and needs to be broken down because ammonia is actually uh you know can be uh, very hazardous to aquatic life so the whereas we have the the oxygen demand of the CBOD is relatively low. You see here it's 0.7 to 1.5 pounds of oxygen per pound of CBOD relative to the nitrogenous BOD, which requires like four and a half pounds of oxygen per um, pound of ammonia. So, you know, it's, it's a huge difference, but it's also worth pointing out that there's, there's quite a bit more um, CBOD generally in a lagoon than um, NBOD. So we need to take into consideration both of these um, demands on oxygen, but we're looking at quite a lot more of the former than the latter. Another factor in, when we look at this is that nitrification, which is that breakdown of ammonia into nitrate and nitrite, is actually, it has a large and unpredictable effect on our lagoon BOD test results. So this is, you know, we're, we always do BOD5 test. And you know, we assume that that's a really accurate way to, to measure what kind of loading we have in our lagoon. But actually, given these, these tests, which were done on a bunch of lagoons in Maine, and this lagoonsonline.com, this is a um, EPA study that actually is quite a bit of interesting data about um, lagoon aeration, that we see that the, that the test where they isolated the um, CBOD from the NBOD was quite a bit more steady, whereas there's these huge spikes in the um, BOD5 test when the, C when the nitrogenous um, effect, so the ammonia, was taken out. So, you know, those, the, um, it, it's, you know, it's not something that you need to do every day, but it would be very interesting to study how much of your your lagoon loading is actually that um, ammonia load and how much is the carbonaceous BOD. Further breaking down our BOD5, we can see that algae has a huge influence on our BOD uh, test results too. And this one may be a little bit harder to read. We see that the, that the open circles, the middle line there, the, the dashed line, this is the BOD that comes from algae. So either algae that is using oxygen at night for respiration or that simply has um, broken down at the bottom of the lagoon and is um, creating some oxygen demand. So we see there's a lot of factors that bring oxygen demand into our lagoon. Another is actually the hydraulic retention time in the lagoon. This is an interesting factor that we don't always think about. And if we have multiple cells, it can be really fascinating to look at your, um, take a BOD test in various locations of your lagoon. It's very common that the first cell is actually taking out almost all of the CBOD um, from human activity. It's generally reduced quite quickly in the first cell. So that's um, represented by the conceptual sketch here that this chart shows that the CBOD is reducing very quickly to point A in say the first cell. And that then as the, as the water goes through our treatment process for um, you know, weeks and some months, 
it actually generates some um, oxygen demand from algal respiration and from nitrification, which the nitrification um, is the transition of uh, ammonia into nitrate and nitrite. So this is not a bad thing, really. It's good that we are breaking down the ammonia, but um, we can sometimes we can see that um, we're actually adding a bit more BOD as the um, retention time of the lagoon increases. So, you know, in order to get to some of these subtleties in understanding how lagoon aeration is um, working in our lagoon, what kind of, um, where is the BOD coming from, we can do some alternate lagoon tests. And these tests are, just, this is a reproduced from uh, Steve Harris's Wastewater Lagoon Troubleshooting, which is a great book um, that you all may be interested in. Um, and the, you know, we have standard BOD5 test. So this is the one that we saw, you know, it's really jumping around because um, it, it's hard to tell, you know, there's, there's a big factor that is this um, uh, nitrogenous BOD. So it's, it's making it, it's, you know, not as reliable as we'd like it to be. So we can um, filter out with a um, nitrification suppressant we can, well, I'm sorry, with the SBOD is a filtered BOD test that removes the insolubles. So it measures the most readily oxidizable, oxid, oxidizable portion of the sample. And then we can use that, um, that filtered sample with a nitrification suppressant to measure that CBOD. So this would be just the um, carbonaceous BOD demand. We're essentially suppressing nitrification from occurring so we can compare that to our regular BOT test and have an understanding of what, um, what portion of the oxygen demand is um, from ammonia. So we can also um, measure the effect our sludge blanket has had with the SCBOD test. Um, and that can be important to, to thinking about the effect that algae has on the BOD test. And also if you're, if you're getting pretty, you know, really high BOD, even though you have a lot of aeration, it may have to do with a buildup of sludge in your lagoon. So a test like this may be helpful to understand what um, you know, might be at the root of the problem. Now, there's always other reasons um, for aeration besides just this um, CBOD. Um, of course, nitrification, we've been discussing how breaking ammonia down into nitrates and nitrites requires quite a bit of oxygen per pound of ammonia. And then really important one in lagoons is that sometimes we're providing, um, you know, we have plenty of oxygen for our BOD demand, but what the aerators are really doing is mixing. So, you know, as you, as you try to target the amount of air that you really require for treatment in your lagoon, what might end up being the controlling factor is mixing. So, you know, keep that in mind as you make changes um, and see whether, whether mixing is, um, you know, a factor that can be limited with time clocks or with um, VFDs as Sean will discuss later, but always keep it in mind as a factor that's important. And then one of the things that, um, that we wanna think about when we're talking about aeration in lagoons is what kind of lagoons are we talking about? Because um, different types of lagoons use aeration for different purposes. A facultative lagoon replies upon natural biological treatment. The aerobic surface water um, gets, gets air from algae and also from wind blowing across the surface. And down below, lower in the lagoon, we have an anaerobic sludge decom decomposition that's going on. So this is very different than probably, if you're on this webinar, you probably don't have a facultative lagoon because you're not using any energy. So on the far end of the spectrum at the bottom, fully mixed is pretty rare. It's something that is really a lot closer to like an activated sludge process. So we would generally consider um, most of the lagoons that we see um, in our assessments are partial mixed aerated lagoons. So we use mechanical aeration and or mixers, um, but don't necessarily maintain like complete mix like you'd see in an um, aerated basin in an activated sludge plant or in a fully mixed lagoon. Um, we, you know, we're not maintaining everything in suspension, but we are mixing in order to make sure that our microbes and our, um, our 
you know, pollutants are coming into contact um, with oxygen, that everything is, treatment is able to happen. And this doesn't necessarily achieve a uniform water column. So whereas facultative is aerated at the top and fully um, anaerobic at the bottom, we're not gonna have that much of a um, segmentation with the partial mixed aerated, but it's not necessarily totally uniform either. So um, whereas fully mixed is like completely mixed all the time, a partial mix may have a little bit of um, water column changes similar to a uh, facultative, but not as extreme. So with uh, types of lagoons, you know, in terms of trying to understand why is it that we are essentially, why is it that we're not a facultative lagoon? Um, we wanted to look a little bit at what type of loading would be appropriate for a facultative versus an aerated lagoon based on the numbers. So states often use uh, 0.2 pounds of BOD per person for permitting. So we're using this number um, to kind of get a sense of like how many people could we support with a facultative lagoon of a certain size. So if we're looking at um, the figures for what a facultative lagoon, according to the EPA, is, is expected to be able to support, that's about 15 to 35 pounds of BOD per acre of pond per day. So let's say we take like a six acre pond, which is fairly standard. Um, that would be about 90 to 210 pounds of BOD per day, which is about 450 to 1,000 people. So a lot of you are probably saying, oh, well, you know, that's like, you know, it's, it's just a little surprising to me because I thought, well, gosh, that's, you know, a lot of, a lot of communities are, you know, aerating at that level. So a six, air, a six acre aerated lagoon is, you know, is able to handle quite a bit more um, BOD per day. So in a way, we're not totally just aerating for, um, to respond to our BOD demand. Because one of the other key factors here is detention time. What can we do? Um, what is the detention time with this same hypothetical six acre pond? Let's say it's pretty deep. Let's say it's a 10 foot deep pond. So it's about, and we're looking at about 15 million gallons in the pond. And let's say we have, 200 gallons per person per day and 1,000 people. That's 0.2 million gallons per day. So given the um, equation here at the top, which is a simple equation for detention time, it's our pond volume divided by the influent rate. So the water's coming in, pushing out the water that's in there. As long as we don't have any short circuiting or anything, the theoretical detention time should be 75 days, which for a facultative lagoon, that's really too short. So one of the main reasons that we aerate is that we can get um, our detention time down. So down to, you know, a, a month or two um, in our ponds. So the ponds don't have to be uh, too large and can handle the amount of water that's coming in. So another, another reason that, um, that we aerate, or maybe that we aerate the way we do, is that we're, we're trying to get the BOD out as we saw earlier in the in really the first cell at the beginning of the treatment process. And then another important aspect is um, settling and filtering out that water. So here's a, an example of a kind of standard setup where we see quite a lot of aerators in the first cell, a sort of medium amount of aerators in the second cell, and then two um, polishing ponds that are, are for settling that are um, not aerated at all. So we're aerating really, especially to, to support the BOD removal in our first cells where mixing and air is really important. So those are some of the main reasons that we air it. And I think we have a quick poll question that maybe Sean can put up to kind of um, review some of the big um, concepts of why do we air it, some of the fundamentals of aeration in lagoons. And then I will pass it to Sean to talk to you all about how we are, right? where that air comes from in our lagoons. So here's the poll question. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a review. It's an we'll, we've we'll got a review one right after this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, have you had an energy ass assessment for your facility? Um, and hopefully for some of you, if the answer is no, you'd be interested in having one, and please do let us know, we'd be happy to come out. Um, discuss your system and produce that report that we talked about. So it's looking like about 
50 50. Yeah, that's a pretty even split. Yeah. Here, let me share the results with you guys. Actually, it's exactly 50 50. So, <laughs> um, thank you to all of you who, you know, have, are here today, whether you've had an assessment or not, and hope we can help in the future, either with your implementation assistance, if you have had an assessment or with an assessment. And with that, thanks for listening. And I'll pass to Sean to discuss how we aerate our lagoons. Well, we do have our second poll question before I jump in here. Oh, um, do so, we? Yeah, that's an excessive uh, DO problem that lagoons might have. Um, so there's two answers that we're looking for here. Um, excessive DO can lead to algal blooms, uh, waste energy, uh, it increases the plant's carbon footprint. Um, if your lagoons have denitrifying sections, maybe that can carry over into them and interfere with that denitrifying process, or it can inhibit uh, BOD removal. So yeah, it wastes, excessive aeration is a problem because it wastes energy and because it might impede our ability to um, fully uh, denitrify. So, you know, that's something that we can we talk about in our future webinars, but too much oxygen is not gonna let us have um, anaerobic um, treatment or anoxicant treatment that we need for de dry nitrification. Well, cool, sorry to miss that poll question. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Right. So we'll share those results there. So it looks like most people got the correct uh, couple answers there. Um, the denitrifying zones, most lagoons, um, it's, it's an even split. Some lagoons have uh, denitrifying built into them. Some lagoons don't yet, um, but we expect that that will be kind of a growing trend uh, as more and more facilities are, are concerned with nutrient removal and eutrophication of, of waterways um, after treatment plants. So uh, for those of you that are doing, de uh, uh, have denitrifying zones already, you're the ones that probably got that uh, correct answer there. All right, so now we'll move into how do we aerate our lagoons. Um, and one way that's kind of unique to lagoons themselves is that you can use natural processes and take advantage of those in your aeration process. Uh, the growth of algae during the day uh, when the sun is out causes that algae to produce dissolved oxygen into the surface waters of the lagoon. And you can take advantage of that as part of your respiration process. The trade-off is that at night, that algae will switch respiration, start absorbing that uh, oxygen from the water and produce CO2 instead. Um, and so you do have to kind of compensate with your own aeration systems for that uh, fluctuating uh, DO production from that source. Uh, another thing that lagoons can take advantage of is natural wind currents and mixing of surface waters. Um, where we particularly see this is uh, facultative lagoons that have been converted and upgraded to aerated lagoons. The aeration has been added to increase the capacity of that lagoon system. And you're uh, mainly pulling oxygen off air contact with the surface of the water. The aerators are providing a little bit more mixing to mix that air deeper into the water column. Helps reduce the sludge blanket level in the lagoon by providing more contact between microbes and that sludge so it can be digested down and reduced. Um, and so uh, those are kind of the two big areas that lagoons have an advantage where activated sludge systems don't because they're more focused on a deeper tank um, that's aerated and mixed. Um, but not as much surface area. Uh, and as we've already touched on, uh, for lagoons that have denitrification process, you've got bound oxygen um, in ammonia and nitrate nitrogen that's being converted um, to nitrates and then into nitrogen gas. Um, so if you can set up your lagoons with anoxic conditions where you've got a very low DO concentration, uh, in a section there, then you can remove nitrogen gas from the oxygen or from the, uh, the wastewater. Um, and that separation of nitrate into nitrogen gas also releases dissolved oxygen into the water from those microbes. Um, and that provides a significant source of oxygen. It's about uh, just shy of three pounds of oxygen per pound of nitrate nitrogen that's broken down into nitrogen gas. Um, and so uh, that can also be a means to help reduce your energy impact by taking advantage of that denitrification process to absorb oxygen from a natural source that you're not having to input energy into the system uh, to obtain that oxygen from. Um, 
So what we see a lot of lagoons doing that have a denitrification process is what we call tapered aeration. Uh, and Jane kind of covered it already in the first section um, where the entire first lagoon had more aeration than the second one. Uh, but we also see where at the influent portion of the lagoon, there's a heavier concentration of aerators there. So you might have a couple of rows of five aerators. Um, and then the next rows might have three aerators. And then the last row might have only one or two aerators. Um, and so the aerators, as you move through the process, are less focused on providing that oxygen content and more just providing a little bit of mixing into the system. Um, but that oxygen content is tapering off as you flow through that lagoon to the effluent side. And that sets up a little bit of that denitrification process as well. Um, so the next big thing to focus on as far as the equipment that's out in the lagoon providing that aeration is its oxygen transfer efficiency. Um, things to be aware of for all equipment when the weather is cold out and you're drawing air into the system, um, cold air is more dense. It has more oxygen content per unit volume of air um, and colder water can hold more dissolved gases in it. So in cold situations, it's easier to put more oxygen in the system usually you can turn down the amount of aeration that you're doing and save some energy and still meet your desired target uh, BOD removal rates. Also be aware that if you're over aerating your lagoon, as Jane mentioned, we find a lot of lagoons are somewhere around six milligrams per liter, um, where most studies have shown that for optimal balance between BOD removal rates and energy consumption is somewhere around two milligrams per liter. Um, but as you increase the oxygen concentration in the water, you've got less differential in the oxygen concentration between the air and the water. And it's harder to push that oxygen into the water then. Uh, so it takes a little bit more energy. Um, you got to add a little bit more aeration into the system um, if you're trying to maintain a higher uh, DO level. Uh, so a couple things to be aware of um, if you're trying to control your system. Temperature fluctuations have a big impact on energy. You can save a lot in cooler weather by dialing back. And then just looking at your DO concentrations uh, as a whole, um, if you can reduce your DO, it's easier to put DO into the water at a lower concentration that also kind of has a feedback um, on reducing your energy consumption. Another thing to be aware of is the depth of your lagoon. Um, especially if you're using any kind of subsurface aeration system, the deeper your lagoon is, the longer those bubbles stay under the water before they reach the surface, the more amount of time they have for oxygen to be drawn out of that air bubble into the water, and the more aeration you get for that. Um, what we find at a lot of lagoons, again, most of the time what we find is a facultative lagoon has been upgraded to a partially mixed aerated lagoon, and they do that through the addition of a mechanical mixer. Um, Surface aerators are pretty convenient in that they're, they're easy to place. Uh, the first costs for them are usually pretty low. Um, you don't have to run air lines to connect them. There's just uh, the electrical connections out to the water. Um, <clears throat> but these are kind of the lower end of your oxygen transfer efficiency in terms of kilograms or pounds of oxygen per horsepower um, of energy input. Um, so, couple different types here. Um, horizontal jets and vertical splash mixers uh, are the kind that kind of focus more on increasing the surface area of water contact with the air. Uh, they're splashing uh, water up into the air so it can absorb oxygen and then as it lands back in the surface of the lagoon it gets mixed into the water column and that transfers that DO that's in that the air that was uh, the water that was splashed in the air back into the water column. Uh, where horizontal aspirators are kind of a surface mixer that's doing a bit of subsurface aeration um, and mixing at the same time. As the propeller spins on those, air gets drawn down through the propeller shaft, injected into the water. Um, the spinning propeller chops those bubbles up into finer bubbles and, and sprays them out um, under the surface of the water. Um, those have a slightly higher efficiency than ones that are splashing into the air. Um, but the downside uh, to most of these surface aeration systems is they do have a limited depth that they can uh, mix that DO into the water column to. Um, and so you do lose a little bit of efficiency in that you're, you're only mixing the upper surface level of a deeper lagoon um, if they're being used for that application. Um, so usually these are 
most optimal for shallow lagoons, particularly ones that are converted from facultative lagoons looking for that additional treatment capacity. Um, another thing to note is if you do have surface splashers, there is a bit of a health concern there um, and that you're splashing wastewater into the air where it can be aerosolized and carried off on the wind. Um, and so there does have to be some uh, consideration for, for health and safety with, with uh, splashing systems. Um, but by the numbers, um, when you're looking at treating for about 300 pounds of BOD per day for 24 hours, um, depending on the treatment system or the, the aeration system you have installed, it's somewhere between seven and 20 horsepower to treat about 300 pounds of BOD per day. Moving on to subsurface systems, um, we've got fine bubble and coarse bubble as the, uh, the main options that we see for subsurface aeration. Um, again, most of the time we're gonna see these in conversions for deeper lagoons uh, that are upgrading from existing surface systems uh, to a more efficient subsurface system. Um, they're a little bit more efficient uh, than the surface aerators, uh, 3.7 to four kilograms of oxygen per kilowatt hour, six, six and a half pounds uh, per horsepower hour. Um, and so what we expect is that for about a 300 pound per day load, um, depending on coarse or fine bubble aeration, somewhere between five to eight horsepower um, every 24, uh, for a 24 hour uh, operation at 300 pounds per day of, of BOD loading. Um, something to be aware of though, is that there is uh, a trade-off um, with uh, coarse bubble and fine bubble systems as far as mixing goes. Um, and usually what we see for a lot of uh, lagoons is when they convert over to uh, subsurface systems, um, they tend to stick to coarse bubble uh, aeration because it provides more mixing uh, than fine bubble systems do. Uh, with fine bubble systems, you have to add a lot more aerators and a denser floor coverage in order to maintain mixing because as each bubble is smaller, it's in less contact with the volume of water. So each bubble provides less uplift of water uh, to generate a mixing flow um, from the bubbles rising up through the water column. Um, so uh, a lot of times for lagoons, coarse bubble or a mix of coarse bubble and fine bubble from an aeration system gives kind of an optimal trade-off between your aeration needs and the needs for mixing in the system. It's not too often that we see straight fine bubble aeration for lagoon systems. Um, unless they're uh, fully mixed lagoon systems. Um, so just as I noted, you get much better oxygen transfer with fine bubble, but you get a little bit less mixing. With the coarse bubble, you get better mixing, a little bit less oxygen transfer. Um, so really it's optimizing that trade-off, figuring out what you need for your particular system. For most partial mixed lagoons, the coarse bubble is gonna be probably your optimal trade-off uh, in that. Um, something else to be aware of when considering coarse uh, subsurface uh, aeration systems versus surface mixers. Um, surface mixers do have an advantage in first cost um, in that the installation of those systems is easier. They also have a slight advantage um, in ease of maintenance um, in that they're already on the surface, usually on a tether, you can haul them in um, or go out in a boat, pick them up, load them into the boat, take them to shore to do maintenance. Um, where if you go with a subsurface aeration system, um, it's usually run out on a, you might have a floating air header that goes out to those discs and then uh, lines that drop down to the, the actual diffusers, um, or you might have completely submerged aeration lines. Um, locating uh, those aerators, if one gets plugged up and stops aerating, um, may be hard to locate them unless you've got a float attached to it as a marker. Um, so, um, you have a little bit more um, maintenance man hours and um, locating and pulling up these uh, subsurface aerators um, to maintain them as far as clogging and, and maintaining your air diffusion. Uh, where the surface systems, uh, your main trade-off there is maintenance for mechanical purposes, uh, swapping out oil for gearboxes, things like that. Uh, something to be aware of. Something else uh, to be aware of with your aerators is proper design needs to be considered in order not to set up a short circuit situation. Uh, there have been some lagoons that they put in the aerators in just a grid pattern. 
Um, and what tends to happen is if the inlet and outlet are kind of lined up and the aerators are also lined up in a grid, it creates just this channel right down the middle of the lagoon uh, for short circuiting purposes. Um, so if you're looking at kind of an aeration system, uh, it's good to kind of stagger the rows so that you've got uh, a crisscrossing pattern that can make sure that you don't have a direct flow of influent to effluent in your lagoon. Um, and we have seen some lagoons that as they do upgrades, um, particularly if they're going from a few surface uh, mixers to a subsurface system, um, that they place a few more uh, subsurface aerators around in order to break up any potential short circuiting. Um, the additional mixing can also help break up sludge islands that can set up a short circuit path as well. Um, and so uh, something to be aware of there is that that's also going to change your hydraulic retention time for your lagoon. Um, and as we noted earlier, there's a fine balance between uh, you want to have the proper retention time to remove as much uh, BOD loading as possible. Um, but if you have too long of a retention time, then you can start having more issues with uh, algae growth in the lagoon, duckweed growth um, that's going to add in suspended solids um, and additional loading for those uh, biological components that aren't necessarily the original BOD that we were trying to treat in that system. So once you've looked at optimizing the distribution of air into your system, then it's time to look at supplying that air efficiently. What kind of system are you going to use to push that air out? Um, if you're using a surface mixer, not much to consider there. The mixer that's providing that aeration is just the motor that's mounted onto that mixing device. If it's a splasher, you've just got the, the turbine underneath that's splashing that water into the air. Um, if it's uh, like an aspirating system, then you just got the shaft and propeller connected to the motor. Um, where this really comes into consideration is if you've got subsurface mixing connected to a blower system. Um, so probably the lowest cost option are the rotary low blowers. Um, we still see a lot of two low blowers um, out in uh, aeration systems, but we're seeing that those are being replaced with three lobe systems. Um, the reason being it reduces vibration, so it reduces maintenance on wear and tear uh, on the blower systems from uh, the impact of air moving through the piping systems. Um, it rattles the motors around, um, rattles piping around, can create additional leaks in the system. Uh, so going to a smoother distribution of airflow coming out of that uh, blower reduces the maintenance for system leaks and things like that. Um, <clears throat> They are lower efficiency though, kind of the lowest available, um, depending on uh, how much turn down you're using for those systems. And we'll get into that here in a little bit when we touch on other systems. Um, but you're looking about 45 to 70% uh, efficiency for those systems uh, and about a 50% turn down. Um, the main limiter for turn down for these is heat dissipation from the motor system. Um, as you start slowing down the blower, the main source of dissipating heat from the system is the air moving through the blower and being carried out into the lagoon. As you slow that down, you slow that heat removal process as well. Um, so most of the time when you're looking at these blower systems, the limitation for turndown is going to be the, the heat dissipation off of them and not necessarily um, flow requirements, pressure requirements in the lagoon. <clears throat> So kind of other types of positive displacement systems that we see uh, that aren't as common. Um, I've only seen one so far of a piston or reciprocating blower system uh, for a lagoon. Uh, and it's pictured here. Um, these are uh, particularly high vibration level as you've got a single pest piston rocking back and forth. Um, they do have a higher efficiency, but there's a much higher maintenance rate, much higher uh, heat generation rate. Um, and so um, these are fairly rare for use. Um, rotary screw blowers are a new uh, kind of a hybrid between the rotary lobe system and uh, hybrid screw blowers. Um, they offer the lowest vibration uh, for positive displacement systems, the highest efficiency as you're kind of approaching uh, the kind of efficiency that you get from centrifugal systems. And they've got a little bit higher turndown because they've got a little bit less of that heat generation. Uh, 
And so you can get about 50 to 60% turned down from those. Uh, moving on to centrifugal systems. Um, what we find most commonly out of plants if they've got centrifugal systems is a multi-stage or single stage centrifugal blower. These have really high efficiency at their design point, 70 to 85%. If you've got constant demand, these are a great option. Um, however, they do have limited turn down somewhere around 30 to 50%. Uh, the main reason being as you back off the speed on a blower like this, you also back off the head pressure that it can output. Um, a lot of times what we find for these is a throttling valve on the inlet or outlet. Um, and that's an inefficient way to control the airflow out of these systems, um, but it's the lowest cost option uh, that we see at a lot of lagoons. Um, but it's something to be aware of that if you're gonna do an efficiency upgrade, um, that these centrifugal blowers do have a limited range of turn down. Um, you can get maybe a three to one uh, turn down ratio out of those units. Um, where optimal for, especially if you're trying to take advantage of natural processes like algae inputting oxygen during the day, you've got low load then, um, you can see almost three times higher load at night in that situation. You're going to need a blower that has a pretty significant turndown ratio. Um, and so usually what we would recommend for a situation like that is pairing an existing centrifugal blower uh, for those peak demand periods using that highest efficiency during that those peak demand periods, and then having a smaller positive displacement system that has peak efficiency at lower flow rates. And it gives you a better turndown ratio, better efficiency overall. Uh, something else that we see growing in the system is um, turbo blowers. Usually um, these are gonna be used for activated sludge um, plants, but we have seen at very large uh, lagoon systems uh, with particularly ones with with fully mixed aeration, uh, that these might be a, an option for usage. They do have much higher efficiency, um, but again, they've got a limited turn down range, somewhere around two to one, um, a little bit less than that if you're using an air bearing instead of a magnetic bearing, because you need to maintain some air pressure in the turbine to support that bearing. Um, so again, it's rare for lagoons. They are a little bit more expensive, a little bit more pricey. Um, but companies are coming out with smaller turbo blower units now that are more applicable to lagoon processes um, and the, the actual air demands that they have. Um, but the main thing for a turbo blower is you're looking for a system that has a fairly constant loading. If you've got variable loading to the system, you're a little bit better off going with a positive displacement system, maybe pair that with a standard centrifugal blower um, to kind of optimize trading off between the peak efficiencies of those two different types of systems. I think I had just one quick question just to see what people are doing with their aeration before we move on. Um, what are you doing to control aeration in your lagoons? Uh, because we're gonna start moving into control here next. Um, do you have manual timers that you're, you're kind of manually changing the timing of the aeration system as you go? Uh, a manual VFD where You've got a setting that you just set on it and it stays there. Uh, maybe you adjust that seasonally. Uh, or are you automating that system? Do you have timers that are connected to some kind of DO probe or, or flow rate coming into the lagoon? Uh, we've seen a couple of times or automated VFDs on the blower systems or you have no control at all. Uh, and if you have another type of control, if you could throw that into the chat, we'd be interested to learn about other types of uh, aeration control. Okay, so we've got a few more coming in here. Great, so we've got a pretty good mix there of uh, different aeration control types. All right, so as we're looking at uh, our blower efficiencies as, as we move forward here, uh, for positive displacement, just as a summary, they're lower efficiency, but you've got higher turn down capacity. Um, and if you have a lot of fluctuation in demand for your lagoon, that higher turndown can lead to overall higher efficiency um, for that air aeration system. When you're looking at centrifugal blowers, you've got higher peak efficiency for peak demands. If you've got a constant loading rate, um, those are a pretty good option, but you've got less turndown capacity. And so if you've got high fluctuations, these can end up being a lower efficiency option. 
Um, it is important to note there is a, a distinct difference between uh, these types of systems. For positive displacement, when you're looking at energy consumption, if you put that on a VFD, it's a linear relationship between how much you slow down that aeration to how much energy you're going to save. Uh, so if you slow down by 50% on a blower, you're going to save 50% energy. With a centrifugal system, though, uh, those are linked to the fan affinity laws. Um, so we're going to show that here. The, the fan affinity laws state that for uh, each unit of flow you reduce, you reduce, uh, or each unit of speed you reduce that blower operation, um, you reduce your power uh, by the cube of that speed reduction. Uh, so if you reduce by 20%, you're reducing your power consumption by about 52%. Um, so you get significant energy savings from even minor reductions in speed. Um, but again, the other thing to note is you're also reducing your head pressure by the square of that speed reduction. So about uh, for a 20% reduction in speed, you're looking at about a 35, 40% reduction in your uh, head pressure output. Um, so something to be aware of, especially for deeper lagoons with subsurface aeration systems, is that you do have to have uh, some limitation uh, on backing off that speed in order to maintain your head pressure and not put your system into a surge condition, um, which can be damaging to your aeration uh, blowers. Um, but you do have that trade-off um, where even minor uh, speed reductions can have a significant impact on power reduction for a centrifugal system. And that leads us into how to actually control the aeration. Um, so what are the types of inputs for blower control? There's uh, dissolved oxygen. Uh, we also see in some instances oxidation reduction potential. Um, for lagoons, these are a little bit harder to implement um, just because of the large surface area of the lagoons. It's hard to position a sensor where you're going to get a good average reading of what the lagoon's condition is at. Um, lagoons that do use DO systems usually have multiple probes stationed throughout uh, the lagoon and then are taking an average reading to control their aeration systems. Um, temperature uh, is an input that should be considered when looking at blower control. As we noted earlier, um, when it's colder out, um, temperature has an impact on that air density. The more dense the air, the more oxygen content you have per unit volume that you push into the system. Um, although that air has a greater weight, which increases the energy consumption to move one unit of air. Usually there's a significant reduction in the units of air that you need to aerate your system. And so you end up with net energy savings by taking temperature into consideration for your aeration systems. And there are controllers out there available that can, based on ambient air temperature readings, reduce your um, speed of your aeration systems to account for that higher density air and that increased oxygen delivery rate. Uh, time of day is another important consideration. As we noted earlier, if you're taking advantage of uh, algae growth in your lagoons, um, then during the daytime, you've got peak DO production from algae. Um, and then at night, that tapers off. You've got to increase your aeration to compensate for algae now switching to um, actually emitting CO2 instead of uh, dissolved oxygen. Um, time of year has an impact as well. Um, again, that goes back mostly linked to temperature, but also to just loading coming into the facility. And then flow rates. Um, so <clears throat> looking at time clocks, these are cheap, simple, affordable way to, to add a little bit of control to your system. Um, it's fairly low cost. And if you put in a digital time clock system, you can link that to a PLC, uh, Programmable Logic Controller. Um, which ties into your SCADA system. You can then tie that to um, DO probes out in the lagoon. You can tie that to flow rates um, for the lagoon. You can tie that to uh, suspended solids, meters, things like that. Um, there are a couple different sensing methods that you can use to estimate what the loading in the lagoon is. And you can even tie this to what's coming out in the effluent um, and use that to adjust your timers on off cycles based on the load that the lagoon is experiencing. Um, the one downside of doing an on off timer is you're 
you have the potential to do multiple cycles uh, for your aerators uh, in a short period of time, which can increase uh, the maintenance on those motors. Uh, on-off cycles um, are, are fairly, um, uh, they increase the wear and tear on the motor um, because of the inrush current during the on cycle um, that wears down the motor windings and the insulation on the wires. Um, so it's important to be aware of if you're using a timer system, you may slightly increase your maintenance requirements on your motor components. Um, it's also a little bit harder on shafts and bearings uh, if you're doing like a, an aspirating mixer uh, or surface mixing system. Um, so <clears throat> that is kind of the, the lower cost option. For a lot of lagoons, it's a very effective option though. If you have the funds, uh, or you're looking for a little bit more efficiency out of your system, um, then variable frequency drives are a great way to go. Um, they save energy by slowing motors down. Um, since they ramp the motors up in speed, they reduce that inrush current, so you get a lot of savings on maintenance for systems. Um, And you also get a lot more energy efficiency. Again, if you've got a, a positive displacement system, it's that one for one uh, speed reduction to energy reduction ratio. And for centrifugal systems, it's that, that, that cubic relation between energy and speed. Um, <clears throat> and then if you're looking at a variable frequency drive or an automated timer system, um, what kind of controls are you linking to to actually control those systems? How do they know how fast to run? Um, one thing that's very common is dissolved oxygen sensors. Uh, there's a couple different types. Uh, electrochemical um, uses a galvanic reaction uh, between oxygen in the water and a, a, a probe and the probe. Uh, it requires flow rate over that meter in order to get an accurate reading. Uh, and then there are optical sensors. Um, a light of a specific wavelength has to shine on that uh, a fluorescing material. Um, dissolved oxygen in the water reduces how much that material fluoresces. Uh, so as that dims, that gives you a reading for that DO meter. Um, those don't require flow over them. So they're probably a little more common for lagoon applications where you've got lower flow rates uh, in local areas. Um, but overall, um, the choice of which uh, meter you go with comes down to whether it's going to be experiencing flow or not. Um, the maintenance on them um, for electrochemical, you've got a little bit more frequent maintenance because uh, you've got to, with flow going through that system, that can clog up. You've got to pull that probe, clean that filtering material off, um, occasionally replace portions of the sensor head. Um, so a little bit more frequent maintenance. Uh, for the optical systems, usually you've got to replace the whole probe head um, instead of just individual components. And so you've got a little bit less frequent maintenance, but it's a little more expensive each time you do it. Um, other ways, uh, again, as we noted, if your uh, seasonal air temperature variations have a big impact on um, your aeration needs. As the air gets colder, it gets more dense and has more oxygen content per unit volume. If you can take that into account with your aeration system and deliver the same mass of oxygen um, instead of the same volume of air, um, you can see somewhere between 20 to 30 percent energy savings depending on your, your region, how much air temperature varies, um, by just accounting for that temperature with a system uh, that's programmed to look at air temperature and adjust speed on those in that uh, situation. So some final takeaways for air distribution. Shallow lagoons are going to benefit best from surface aerators because you don't have enough depth for subsurface aerators uh, to be very efficient. Deeper lagoons, subsurface is more than likely the way to go. Uh, graduated aeration improves nutrient removal and minimizes your energy consumption. Um, so if you're looking at uh, future uh, nitrogen uh, reduction requirements in your permit, might be something to look into there. Um, and you want to be very careful about placement of those systems. Make sure you're not creating a short circuit path by placing aerators where it creates a channel between your influent and effluent of your lagoon. For control, timers are a very cost effective option for lagoons. Um, for surface aerators, you've got a small size. Um, for control panels, I mean, um, you've got a small size, um, reduced energy consumption. 
Um, usually makes harder VF, uh, VFDs harder to justify uh, in instances of smaller lagoons. Um, if you've got a larger lagoon, you're closer to a fully mixed situation. Um, you have highly variable loading in your lagoon. VFDs are a very cost effective option, um, particularly with positive displacement blowers. Um, for centrifugal systems, uh, if you have those, um, you might want to look into blower efficiency options, uh, maximizing the efficiency of that blower system to improve your overall aeration efficiency. Um, if you've got high variation in your loading coming into the plant, a turndown ratio of eight to one is typically recommended um, or intermittent operation with timers based on your lagoon's DO levels or, or loading rates. Um, but you, if you do have um, centrifugal blowers, you wanna make sure you're using that peak blower performance. Uh, they're optimized to run at their peak speed. As you reduce the speed, they also lose efficiency. Um, so you may wanna look into adding a smaller positive displacement blower so that you're maximizing the overall aeration efficiency. And lastly, uh, just a little bit of homework. Um, look at your past DMRs for your average monthly baud loading and ammonia loadings. And based on what we had earlier, kind of calculate what your average um, oxygen supply need for your lagoon is. And compare that to what you're supplying with your aeration system. Are you over capacity with your systems or are you under capacity? A lot of times with designs for lagoons, they're sized for a 20 year growth of the community. They're gonna be a little bit oversized. Um, if you don't wanna do that homework, please reach out to us. We'll do it for you. We're happy to do that. Um, so thank you all. If you have questions, please enter them. We'll touch on them quickly here. We've gone a couple minutes over, but I think we've covered the content pretty well. Uh, looks like we had one question come in. Uh, we have an Imhoff tank and a trickling filter ahead of the lagoon. Would that change much? Um, so the Imhoff tank, uh, if I am remembering correctly, is uh, doing a lot of uh, anaerobic digestion, uh, essentially like a septic tank. Um, and then your trickling filter is um, taking care of the aerobic um, digestion of a, a lot of materials. It's adding DO um, and then filtering out a lot of your insoluble solids. Um, and so usually your lagoon that's after those systems is mainly there for final polishing uh, and then running through a rock filter for final filtration. Uh, so a lagoon in that instance is going to have a very, very low um, aeration need. Uh, the main thing you're looking at there is mixing. Um, I would actually look at um, there are solar mixers uh, out there that instead of generating uh, DO in that lagoon, uh, they're just drawing water up from deep in the column and then spreading it out along the surface, generating a circulation loop. Um, and sometimes those are a very, very low energy way. Um, you could probably get the net zero with a system like that um, through a, a solar mixing system. And actually, we, we looked at a plant that had that set up. That was uh, down in uh, Kincaid, if I remember correctly. Um, and that was one of our recommendations for them. Their, their lagoon had such low loading um, that the, the aerators were over, over oxygenating their lagoon. And that was actually leading to uh, some issues with uh, algae and duckweed growth uh, that was then interfering with their, their total solids coming out of that system. It'd be interesting to check the BOD after the um, Imhoff tank mm -hmm. going into the lagoon and see what kind of loading is actually on that pond. Thanks for the question. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A and I haven't noted any coming through the chat. Uh, most of those have been uh, CU requests. Uh, but this uh, has been recorded. Uh, the recording will be linked to our website. Um, I think that link will also be in the email with the certificate and things. Yeah. Great. Yep. Thank you so much, Sean and Jane. Great presentation today. Um, I hope you all learned a lot from today's presentation. Um, and thank you for joining us. Again, this is part one of three in our oxygen or aeration and energy sessions. So the next one will be focused on oxygen transfer, and that will be in November. So everybody that attended today's 
uh, webinar, uh, you will get information about the next event as well. Again, as Sean said, uh, we have been recording this session, so I will share the recording and the presentation slides as soon as they're available, probably either later today or tomorrow. If you've requested a certificate or CEUs, I'll get you that certificate right away, and we'll get you the CEUs when they are immediately available. Um, so thank you again um, for attending the Illinois EPA Office of Energy Fall Webinar Training Series on Introduction to Aeration and Energy, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or need support. Thanks again. Have an awesome afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thank you.